And we're going to spend a few minutes just going over some of the new things that we've learned about um, the complement system in the last uh, five years or so, and then talk about how we're applying them um, to uh, therapeutics in autoimmune disease. Um, here's a disclosure slide. So talking about the complement system as new really might seem a little bit counterintuitive. We all remember that it um, has very ancient evolutionary origins, and those origins actually predate antibodies um, by millennia. Um, the initial description of complement as a host defense system dates back to the dawn of the 20th century. In our clinical experience, though, complement has only moved um, to the center, either left or right, depending on uh, what your bent is, in the past few decades. And really, the field of complement targeted therapeutics is continuing to evolve rapidly. I think for many of us, um, it's been a very exciting opportunity to think about new ways that we can um, address diseases that previously have not had particularly great therapeutic options. So originally, complement was believed to be one protein, and that's how it was described. Now we know that it encompasses at least 27 distinct proteins, and newer ones are being evaluated and discovered all the time. It's kind of like the coagulation system in that it has an initiation, an activation, an amplification, and a regulation schema it tends to be localized on membrane surfaces. And I think that's what's made it uh, difficult to study in the past is it's very hard to interrogate what's going on on these membrane surfaces. The main function of complement, of course, is disruption of membranes. And that's fantastic when it's aimed against pathogens. But of course, we now know that that function can be aimed and either aimed against or normal tissues can be in the line of fire and be sort of innocent bystanders and also become injured. So this slide is looking at, you know, what are the many roles of complement? And, you know, lysis of bacteria is sort of the main thing that we think about but we have to also remember that complement plays an integral role in modulating inflammatory responses. And those inflammatory responses are not only to pathogens, but can also be present in normal physiology. It's very important in directing adaptive immunity. It's very important in intracellular immunity. There's a lot of crosstalk between the complement and the coagulation system, and that's really important in promotion of inflammation and its role in um, debris clearance. The membrane attack complex is very important as a part of the innate and the adaptive immune system. It promotes inflammation and it has a role in debris clearance. So as you can see, through either direct effects or indirect signaling effects, complement really plays um, an integral role in many of the physiologic um, activities of our bodies. So it acts as a bridge really between our innate and our adaptive immune responses, and it allows that response to progress from a very nonspecific immediate one to a more specific one as necessary. So it contributes to our innate immunity by lysis, we all know that complement proteins can eventually form the membrane attack complex, and that can um, cause targeted cells to burst. It's very important in inflammation, and particularly C3A and C5A alert our immune system to threats and attract leukocytes via chemotaxis. They also attract platelets. They can activate endothelial cells as well. And then opsonization and phagocytosis, both foreign bodies, but also as kind of the uh, clearance mechanism for our apoptotic self cells. These cells are coded in complement tags, which are called opsonins, and then that flags them for destruction by the phagocytes. It contributes to our adaptive immunity. So when that immunity gets to be more specific, 
Complement activates antigen pre presenting cells to promote T cell responses. It continues to augment phagocytosis and inflammation. It augments antibody responses via B cells and it enhances immunologic memory via T and B cells. And I highlighted some of those in that kind of orange color so that we can kind of try to remember and think about how are these natural physiologic properties of complement going to be interacting as we talk about autoimmune diseases. Not for anybody to memorize, but really just to demonstrate that although we oftentimes think about these three pathways, the alternative, the lectin, and the classical pathway as being distinct, I think this slide really demonstrates the crosstalk between all of these pathways and how important all of these pathways are in eventually getting to that common or terminal pathway, which involves C3 activation and C5 activation. We're gonna spend a lot of time today in this autoimmune section talking about the classical pathway. You guys will all remember that the classical pathway is um, activated by antigen antibody complexes. And as we think about autoimmunity, we're going to be thinking about self antigens and auto antibodies. So in addition to activating the classical pathway, complement and antibody um, deposition on bacterial surfaces facilitates phagocytosis. And it's not only monocytes and macrophages, but remember there's dendritic cells that can um, supply that function and neutrophils as well. Complement cleavage products, particularly C3A and C5A, act as very potent anaphylactoxins, and they're chemoattractants. They recruit immune cells to that area and modulate that inflammatory response. Complement actually synergizes with neutrophils to potentiate um, their killing capacity and induce this pro-inflammatory feedback loop. Coagulation pathways, which many of us don't ever want to think about, but unfortunately are really intertwined with the complement cascade, and they promote antibacterial activity, they promote hemostasis, but they also um, promote a lot of the inflammation that's taking place. And then the importance of complement in B cell receptor activation has been appreciated. But recent studies have revealed that complements an essential regulator of adaptive immune cell survival and development during both health and infection. So without a negative feedback loop, the system relies on the presence of uh, preformed complement regulators to keep its activation under control. And we've talked a lot in the past about this system losing control. We've talked about it in patients that have complement mediated thrombotic microangiopathic disease and that alternative pathway losing control. Our host cells engage a panel of membrane bound and soluble regulators that limit the action of initiating proteases, interfere with opsonization and amplification and or prevent the formation of the membrane attack complex. So if we you know, sort of look at this again, there's a lot of crosstalk um, between our healthy host cells and the complement system on a regular basis in order to make sure that there's adequate control against complement activation. So some complement activation <clears throat> is always a good thing especially when we are facing invasion by mycobacteria or fungi, but it's not a good thing if we can't regain control. And so some of those control proteins include um, decay accelerating factor, um, cofactors like factor B and factor H, um, C1S, or excuse me, C1H inhibitor or C1 esterase inhibitor. There's carboxypeptidases that um, 
have proteolytic inactivation, there's factor I. So there's a whole variety of things that we depend on in order to control um, complement activity. So homeostasis, right? Healthy cell, we see a mycobacteria, we um, see an apoptotic cell, complement gets activated and we regulate it. But we can have hyperactivation in sepsis and SIRS. We can have misguided activation in autoimmune hemolytic anemias, in um, uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, in NMOSD. And then we can have insufficient regulation like in atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome or PNH. And you can see here, you know, balance is very important in this system. And when there is excessive activation, we get into trouble. When there's insufficient regulation, we get into trouble. When there's insufficient activation, we may not recognize ourselves, and we may develop autoimmune disorders. And then when there's an excessive regulation, it may allow abnormal cells to proliferate. So we wanna always try to be sort of right in this nice balance of things. Now, traditionally we have thought that complement components are solely produced in the liver and released into the circulation and that blood exposed cells have to come into contact with this soluble complement in order for there to be any interaction. There's now a really more complex version, right? Mechanisms and locations um, of complement activation have revealed that an additional layer of complexity um, is present. It's well established now that most nucleated cells can actually produce and secrete a broad set of complement components, many of these which are produced only extrahepatically. And local complement production may actually be the driving force behind many physiologic, but also pathologic processes. And they become particularly important in secluded or immune privileged tissues and organs like the central nervous system. So what are we now thinking about as far as complement? What diseases is complement now being looked at as a driver, as a primary part of the pathophysiology of these diseases? Well, certainly in hematology, I'm very interested in um, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, immune thrombocytopenia, thrombotic microangiopathies, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. But many of our other um, subspecialty colleagues are also interested in complement, central nervous system, uh, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, NMO, maybe Parkinson's, maybe schizophrenia um, in the eye, maybe uveitis, maybe glaucoma in the kidney, certainly um, C3 glomerular diseases, but maybe IgA nephropathies as well from a skin standpoint or a joint standpoint, rheumatoid arthritis, um, psoriasis, um, surgery related, um, maybe uh, acute kidney injury, organ transplantation. And then sort of in, in the middle there, you see SIRS and sepsis, trauma, um, rheumatologic diseases like lupus, and then of course, cancer for GI. Maybe there's a role in Crohn's disease for pulmonary colleagues, maybe a role in um, ARDS, maybe a role in um, asthma. So lots of places where we're now understanding the integral role of complement as a propagator or a driver of the disease process. I listed these two and there is the um, reference down at the bottom. This is a review um, in Nature Reviews of Drug Discovery. And it just lists you know, all of the diseases where there is data implicating complement as a um, process in the disease development. And you can see that um, some we've known about for a while, right? Hereditary angioedema, PNH but then other things like multiple sclerosis, myasthenia, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, antiphospholipid syndrome, macular degeneration, maybe in mood disorders, sepsis and ARDS, osteoarthritis, glaucoma, 
diabetic angiopathy, um, myocardial infarction, ischemia reperfusion injuries. Um, so there's a lot of uh, new data that is out there and additional data being added all the time. So in autoimmune disorders, uh, many of them are now considered to be complement driven as we just discussed. And so the ones that are in bold here are examples of autoimmune disease that have not only um, reached clinical interest, but now have uh, complement-based therapeutics that have been FDA approved. So cold agglutinin disease, immune thrombocytopenia, um, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia gravis, and then um, ANCA-associated vasculitis, and then anti-aquaporin-4 antibody positive NMOSD. So simplified again, three main pathways, the classical pathway, which is generally activated by antigen antibody complexes, that lectin pathway or that mannose binding pathway, and then the alternative pathway, which remember we talk about how that is sort of always sitting at the ready, and it's always there to provide amplification if we activate the complement system by either the classical or the lectin pathway. For autoimmune disease, we're talking about how are we integrating complement via antigen antibody complexes. And so we're really going to be looking at and thinking about classical pathway activation. So in autoimmunity, of course, we know that either B lymphocytes or plasma cells are producing an antibody. That antibody is going to recognize an antigen. And those antigen antibody complexes, particularly if they are IgG or IgM subtype, are going to then activate the classical pathway of complement. We're going to generate uh, C3A and C5A in addition to generating C3B and potentially the membrane attack complex. This is gonna pull in, of course, neutrophils, mast cells, macrophages, et cetera, that are gonna result in chemotaxis, mast cell degranulation, acute inflammation, in order to help us potentially deal with pathogens. But remember that if this process is ongoing related to autoantibodies, we're going to get the same type of reaction. So IgM, as you guys remember, likes to form a pentamer. When IgM does form that pentamer and it interacts with whatever antigen it is recognizing, that antigen antibody complex is a very uh, potent and efficient activator of the classical pathway via binding to C1Q, which then sets into motion the formation of the C1 complex. IgG can do the same thing. IgG tends to do it as a dimer rather than a pentamer. And IgG1 and IgG3 are the most efficient activators of the classical pathway, but at high concentrations, IgG2 can also do the same thing. So what are the consequences? What can possibly happen if we are activating our classical pathway? Well, phagocytosis is one thing. So complement's gonna be activated. C3B is gonna get generated and get attached to the surface of the cell. Um, C3B receptor is going to recognize this C3B, and that's going to allow for phagocytosis. We're also going to get inflammation, um, and we can get C5A and C3A, which are going to be uh, potent activators of neutrophils, which can cause inflammation and tissue injury. And then we can also have abnormal physiologic responses um, without necessarily tissue injury. And one of those um, examples is um, an antibody to the acetylcholine receptor. Um, that antibody binds, a complement gets activated, and then that inhibits binding of the ligand to its receptor. So let's talk a little bit in detail um, about sort of a prototype of uh, complement-mediated autoimmune hemolytic anemia, 
which is cold agglutinin disease. And if we look at our patients who have cold agglutinin disease, the majority of them are gonna present with hemolytic anemia. They're either gonna present with hemolytic anemia and very low grade circulatory symptoms, or they're gonna present with hemolytic anemia and more profound circulatory symptoms. A very small percentage are gonna present with circulatory symptoms alone. If we look at what's happening in cold agglutinin disease, we'll and cold agglutinin syndrome, by the way, we'll remember that an antibody, which is IgM, and they're termed cold because they have their maximum activity at temperatures that are significantly less than core body temperature. Those IgMs are gonna bind to the surface of the red blood cell, recognizing almost always in adults, the big I antigen. When that binding takes place, that pentamerization occurs and activation of complement takes place. Now, if we think about what is causing these two very sort of distinct phenotypes in our patients who have cold agglutinin disease, we can think about what is the IgM itself doing when it's bound to the surface of those red blood cells? And then what is the activation of the classical pathway doing? So when the IgM binds, that's what actually causes the agglutination or the sticking together of the red blood cells. And this is what it's gonna look like when we look underneath the microscope. We're going to see these aggregates of these red blood cells that are stuck together. Remember that the ambient temperature of the air is significantly lower than core body temperature. So at ambient temperature, these IgM antibodies are going to attach to the surface of these red blood cells, and then they're going to form those pentamers, which is going to pull those red blood cells closer together. Picture of how that looks. What it looks like grossly in a test tube, and I have had the opportunity to show some of you uh, gross test tubes of patients' blood who has cold agglutinin disease, and you can see with your naked eye these aggregates of the red blood cells. What happens to the patients is that they develop or can develop these acrocyanotic symptoms, particularly in areas of the body that tend to be less than um, core body, Agglutination of these red cells causes a variety of symptoms that can be mild and transient to more severe and less transient. Now, the binding of those IgM molecules to those red blood cells also tends to be relatively transient. So as a red blood cell circulates back into the core body, those IgMs let go. And you guys will all remember that when we look at a direct antiglobulin test, we don't see a direct antiglobulin positive for IgM. We're going to see it positive for the result of the IgM, which is activation of the classical pathway and generation of C3B. So when we see a direct antiglobulin test, we're going to see it positive almost always in cold agglutinin disease for a very high level of C3B attached to the surface of those red blood cells. When that happens, one of two things, either the cell is recognized as having that opsonin C3B on the surface, an extravascular hemolysis, phagocytosis takes place in the liver primarily by the Kupfer cells, or if there's an overwhelming amount of C3B formed, it overwhelms that natural inhibitors that live on the surface of our red blood cells. Remember that those are CD55 and CD59, so that we'll go on into that terminal portion to generate a membrane attack complex and intravascular hemolysis can occur. In the majority of patients who have cold agglutinin disease, the majority of their ongoing hemolysis is extravascular. But in times of crisis, when they get an infection or we do something else to them that stimulates additional IgM formation, we can get overwhelming formation of C3B, which allows for intravascular hemolysis.
So when we look at our patients who have cold agglutinin disease, we see that the majority of them are going to have either a severe or moderate anemia. Only a small percentage are going to have mild or compensated hemolysis or mild or compensated anemia. And so in a clinical way, we want to think about how can we help these patients? We've been a number of years, you know, over 50, telling patients to stay warm. But what we know clinically is that that may be not necessarily enough to limit this uh, complement mediated hemolysis. So if we look at these C3B coded cells, um, they are being recognized again by phagocytes, those Kupfer cells in the liver, and that results in extravascular hemolysis. If the formation is overwhelming and the red cells cannot contain the formation of uh, C5, then we're going to get the formation of that membrane attack complex, which it forms that transmembrane channel and results in intravascular hemolysis. So based on all of this, complement seemed like a reasonable target in cold agglutinin disease, right? We know that uh, bound um, antigen antibody complexes activates the complement system. We know that it's through the classical pathway. We know that extravascular hemolysis is the major mechanism. Intravascular becomes more severe in acute exacerbations. And so how could we help our patients? Well, for the longest time, as many of you are familiar, the only um, way that we had pharmacologically of interacting with the complement system was through an anti-C5 monoclonal antibody, which is ecolizumab. So could we use ecolizumab to help our patients who have cold agglutinin disease? Um, we looked at this in a clinical trial, um, and ecolizumab does prevent membrane attack formation, which is mediated by binding to C5. A phase two study looked at 13 patients they received um, ecolizumab and was noted that their um, LDH did decrease but not normalize. Their hemoglobin did also increase but didn't normalize. And eight out of the 13 patients did gain transfusion independence. But what the clinicians um, in the trial noted was that while the brisk hemolysis seemed to stop, there was still evidence of ongoing extravascular hemolysis. So how could we potentially try to help our patients in a better way? If we know that antigen antibody complexes are activating this classical pathway, could we interfere somehow with the activation higher up so that we could stop the formation and stop the a deposition of C3B on the surface of those red blood cells. So we know that the C1 complex is composed of C1Q, C1R, and C1S. C1Q acts as the binding site for these antigen antibody complexes, and then C1R and C1S um, uh, bind with the C1Q to form an active uh, protease, which is then able to cleave C4. So um, this is a picture of that as well. If we can block the classical pathway, could we help these patients? So sutimlimab is a monoclonal antibody that binds to and inhibits the activity of C1S and specifically prevents classical pathway activation. So we were lucky enough um, here at Georgetown to be able to participate in um, Cardinal which was an open label study of sutimlimab in patients who had cold agglutinin disease who had been receiving blood transfusions. And the schema here was um, a 24 week treatment period and then a two year safety extension. All of these patients had a baseline hemoglobin of less than 10. They had evidence of active hemolysis with a total bilirubin above normal. And they had had at least one blood transfusion within six months of enrollment. 
and they could not have received um, any uh, rituximab or other combination therapy within the last six months. And of course, they needed to have actual uh, idiopathic cold agglutinin disease, not cold agglutinin syndrome, secondary to an underlying infection, lymphoproliferative disorder, rheumatologic disease, et cetera. It was a weight-based dosing. So um, patients less than 65, less than 75 kilos got one dose, greater than 75, they got a higher dose. Loading, as we do with most monoclonal antibodies, one week apart, and then every two weeks. So sutimumab um, targets the early complement pathway. It inhibits the formation of the C1 complex. Um, it stops completely formation of C3 by classical pathway activation. So in these 24 patients, the um, mean hemoglobin increased to greater than 11. The total bilirubin normalized by week three. 71% uh, of the patients were transfusion free uh, weeks five to 26. And then in the extension trial, 86% of those patients were transfusion free. This was published um, in the New England Journal a little bit over um, a year ago as sort of the first therapeutic intervention dealing specifically with the classical pathway. If we look a little bit more closely at that data, we can see the mean hemoglobin responses and also the decrease in the bilirubin level indicating um, complete or near complete shutdown of that extravascular hemolysis. What was also um, uh, encouraging for these patients is that their facet fatigue scores improved. And you can see that C4 levels also significantly increase. So if you're not using the C4 to generate uh, complement factors lower down in the pathway, then the C4 levels are going to improve. And as you can see, classical complement pathway activity was pretty much completely inhibited. So everyone said, that's great. Um, you took a pretty sick group of people. They were transfusion dependent. They had very low hemoglobins, but you didn't have a placebo group. So how do we really know that this was um, a significant effect? The next study looked at um, patients who had not had a recent history of transfusion, and it was designed to be a double-blind placebo-controlled trial um, involving, again, patients that had cold agglutinin disease. They were less severely affected because although their baseline hemoglobin was less than 10, they had not had any transfusions within the last six months and had not had more than one transfusion within 12 months. And again, cold agglutinin syndrome um, was excluded. And when we look at um, this trial, and we look at the placebo versus the treatment arm at the evaluation standpoint, we can see that the mean hemoglobin improved significantly in patients who were receiving the drug, whereas there was not much change at all in the patients that were um, receiving the placebo. We can also see that facet fatigue scores significantly improved in patients who were receiving um, anti-complement therapy, whereas they were not affected in the placebo group. And I think that this is something that we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. But if we look at um, hemoglobin levels, um, they all improved, uh, bilirubin levels decreased, and facet fatigue scores um, improved um, in these patients. And all of these effects were definitely um, able to be sustained. I think one thing that maybe has been underappreciated by some of these autoimmune diseases and the role of complement and in inflammation is that this is a benign disease, right? Benign hematologist, benign disorder. But the baseline facet fatigue score for these patients is similar to that reported in patients with advanced cancer or rheumatoid arthritis. And so while the laboratories may not be that impressive on some of these patients, they feel this disease. And I think that they feel it because of the generation of C3A and C5A. 
Um, these molecules are so um, potent in their ability to generate a systemic inflammatory state that especially in cold agglutinin disease, if we're able to shut off, right, any generation of C3A and any generation of C5A, in addition to stopping hemolysis, whether it be intravascular or extravascular, we're shutting off a significant component of systemic inflammation, which helps people feel much better. So you guys all remember that um, anti-complement therapies definitely have um, some safety precautions. Remember that all the patients in these trials were vaccinated against meningococcal, pneumococcal, and haemophilus uh, bacteria. We have to remember um, you know, that um, while this did have an effect on hemolysis, because the cold-induced circulatory symptoms are related to those IgM molecules, and this really didn't have much effect on IgM, that cold-induced symptoms are going to probably be there. Is this a possible role as a bridge to anti-B cell therapy, which takes longer to become effective? Or could we co-administer this with our anti-B cell therapies? We don't know yet. Um, and those clinical trials are definitely ongoing. So what are some other um, ongoing research in complement-directed cold agglutinin disease therapy? There is a um, drug called pegcetacoplin, which blocks the formation of C3B um, and prevents RBC opsonization. So it's going to act at C3 and prevent that generation. There's um, a peptide C1 inhibitor which is um, in uh, development, no published clinical studies yet. And then there's also a humanized anti-C1Q monoclonal antibody, which is in clinical trials, but no results are published yet. You know, as always with these really rare disorders, um, patients that have cold agglutinin disease are encouraged to participate in clinical trials. I want to shift directions just a little bit um, and talk about ITP. It's a little bit more common than cold agglutinin disease. Um, we certainly see patients getting admitted to the wards or patients in our clinics that have ITP. You guys remember that this is an autoimmune disease. Autoantibodies are produced that recognize uh, glycoproteins on the surface of platelets. So there's platelet autoantibody production platelet opsonization, and then destruction of opsonized platelets by splenic macrophages. And that's been kind of the um, paradigm that we've thought about in ITP for a very long time. And as you can see on the other side, many of our therapies um, have been directed against either removing the spleen, removing the site of destruction, uh, decreasing antibody production, um, increasing the number of platelets we make with thrombopoietin receptor agonists, or trying to interact with that T cell, B cell uh, structure and um, decrease that signaling pathway with things like azothioprine, cyclosporine, mycophenolate. But we all know, and you guys have seen some of these patients getting admitted to the hospital uh, time and time again, that there are a subset of ITP patients who don't respond to any of these therapies. We take their spleens out, we put them on multiple therapies, either sequentially or in conjunction, and they're still profoundly thrombocytopenic. And that got um, some of us thinking, could there be another mechanism? You know, this is an antibody antigen mediated disease and if antigen antibody complexes can affect our red blood cells, could they affect our platelets as well? We all know that this is a disease of increased platelet destruction, but where and how is that platelet destruction being mediated? So we've talked about this classical pathway. It's been um, noted that increased classical pathway activity um, is in many diseases with autoantibody production, and we just talked extensively about cold agglutinin disease. So if we look back 
um, in ITP literature um, as far back as the 1980s, it was noted that patients with ITP had evidence of complement activation. For a long time, this was thought to potentially be an epiphenomenon, but here recently, we've got increasing amounts of data that 50% of patients with ITP have autoantibodies that activate complement or have complement detectable on the platelet surface. Complement deposition on platelets has been shown to correlate with the degree of thrombocytopenia. So the more thrombocytopenic you are, the more complement there seems to be on the surface of your platelets. About a third of patients who have ITP have substantial reductions in serum C3, C4, and CH50 levels compared with healthy individuals. And in vivo, excuse me, in vitro, inhibition of the classical pathway was shown to be able to reduce complement deposition um, on platelets. So here's some of the data looking at um, healthy volunteers, non-immune thrombocytopenia, and then ITP patients. And again, you see that it um, varies anywhere from 58 uh, to 47%, but we do see the capability of this sera being able to activate complement. So we know that complement cascade triggers a lot of processes. Um, complement activating autoantibodies could um, and do seem to result in the deposition of complement um, C3B on the surface of platelets. Could this be allowing, as it does in cold agglutinin disease, for the liver to become a primary place for platelet phagocytosis? So we postulated that if we could inhibit the classical pathway in patients that have very refractory ITP, we might be able to see a therapeutic signal, we might be able to see uh, patients' platelet counts improving. So this was an open label phase 1b study. It's really a proof of concept trial where we took patients who had multi-refractory chronic ITP. They had to have failed two or more prior therapies. They had a platelet count of less than 30,000. And we placed them on sutimlimab, uh, anti-C1S monoclonal antibody, uh, weight-based dosing, again, that same loading and then bi-weekly dose. They were treated um, for um, up to 23 weeks, and then there was a washout. So this is this nine-week washout period. And then if they had responded in the uh, first part of the trial, part A, they were allowed to go back on their regular dose for a long-term uh, safety follow-up period. And what we um, noted um, was that there was a 41.7% overall response rate. And a third of these patients actually had a complete response. And that was that their platelets were over 100,000. All of these responses were durable and the time to response was less than two days. So you guys know that we admit patients, we give them IVIG, we wait for two to four days to see a response. Well, these patients showed um, a pretty significant response um, up at, as quickly as eight hours after their first dose of anti-complement therapy. There were three patients who didn't fulfill the response criteria, but were considered responders. Um, who had a stable um, increase in their platelet count and no bleeding or need for rescue therapy. What was also, I think, nice about this trial is that in the washout time, when we see the complement activity, which is in the orange um, line go up, we see the platelet count go back down. And then when we re um, expose the patients to anti-complement therapy, you can see again, complement levels go down and platelet counts go back up. So we felt like this was a pretty good uh, proof of concept that in patients who had um, ITP, this was the first clinical evidence 
that when we inhibit classical complement pathway activity, we are able to see an improvement in platelet counts. So these mean platelet counts increased to greater than 50 by day one and were maintained for the duration. As I said, 41.7% of patients achieved durable response. The washout kinetics were very favorable that this was actually a drug response, even though we didn't have a placebo arm. And then the therapeutic effect was sustained. And these results, I think, really show evidence for the role of complement in the clinical heterogeneity that we see in ITP. Um, this was published recently in Blood Advances. Um, so another way that, you know, here at Georgetown, we're trying to um, promote uh, new ideas and, and new concepts. I'm not a neurologist, and our neurology colleagues are definitely better um, able to provide this information, but I just wanted to let you guys know that you know, complement has been shown to be important in myasthenia gravis. Um, and again, it's related to that classical pathway activity where the membrane attack complex is involved in um, reducing um, the um, uh, availability of acetylcholine receptor expression and reducing muscle contraction. And so, Again, that classical pathway, the um, REGAIN trial um, used ecoluzumab. So if you look back here, we're generating these membrane attack complexes. And when the membrane attack complex is the primary problem, we can interact at C5 and we can shut off the membrane attack complex formation. So this trial was a placebo controlled trial looking at ecoluzumab and placebo in um, patients with uh, myasthenia. There was a blind induction phase, and then um, you can see the open label extension. And 82.6% um, showed relative improvement over placebo um, at week 26. So this drug is now approved for the treatment of patients that have um, acetylcholine antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis. Complement has also been shown to have a role in um, NMOSD, and that role is through membrane attack complexes, again, um, damaging um, the astrocytes. And so um, if MAC formation is the important uh, pathologic driver, inhibiting the membrane attack formation by the use of ecoluzumab can be um, a potential um, therapeutic target. This is the NMOSD PREVENT trial, and they looked at um, relapses, um, which was the primary endpoint, and you can see that um, in the blue line, the ecoluzumab patients did significantly better than the placebo arm, and that was in patients that were not receiving any concomitant immunosuppressive therapy and in patients that were receiving concomitant in a, immunosuppressive therapy, and so this Drug has also been approved for a subset of patients that have NMOSD. I wanted to just briefly talk about complement and malignancy. And, you know, this is a cartoon just basically showing that complement plays a big role um, in not only angiogenesis, but also immune surveillance and immune um, recognition. Um, it plays a role in effector proteins, tumor cells, and then cells of the innate and adaptive immune system in that micro environment, which determines tumor progression. An imbalanced activation of complement in this tumor micro environment triggers the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, not only by tumor cells, but by tumor infiltrating immune cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils. It also um, causes the release of immunosuppressive cytokines, reactive oxygen and nitro nitrogen species. So local inflammation can suppress the activation of effector T cells and create a micro environment that's favorable for tumor growth. Complement activation product C5A promotes angiogenesis and can facilitate tumor cell migration, invasion, and metastases. 
And then activation of complement also triggers the accumulation of these pro-tumorogenic neutrophils within solid tumors, which can potentiate uh, procoagulant responses and form these um, neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. So um, either genetic in mice or pharmacologic blockade of C3, the C3A receptor, or the C5A receptor in various cancer models has consistently resulted in inhibition of tumorigenesis. Combining blockade of complement and a checkpoint inhibitor, which we all know, PDL1, down regulates the T cell response. When we combine these two things, it attenuates tumorigenesis in models of melanoma and lung cancer more efficiently than either therapy individually. And so when we think about this, it opens up some promising avenues for exploring complement inhibition along with immunotherapies tailored to reactivate a patient's own anti-cancer immunity. How can we move this forward, right? So there's lots of opportunities. Complement's very complicated. And so we can disrupt initiating complexes. We can inhibit initiating enzymes. We can inhibit activating enzymes. We can inhibit direct complement components like C3, we can inhibit convertases, we can block activation, we can inhibit chemotaxis, we can block the MAC assembly, we can block the MAC functional pore. So there's lots of different ways that we can interact. And this talks about some of the inhibitors that are available, right? So there's initiation inhibitors like C1 esterase inhibitors and sutimlimab. There's also narcolipamab. There's amplification inhibitors like pegcetacoplin, which is a C3 inhibitor. There's a factor B inhibitor, which is iptocopan. There's a factor D inhibitor, which is danacopan. And then there's infector effector inhibitors like ecolizumab, ravulizumab, crovolimumab, and then a variety of others. So there's lots of compounds that are now available that interact very specifically with different aspects of um, ac activation or amplification so that we can continue to study. So where are we, right? So 2007, ecolizumab was it um, in PNH. We've now got a longer acting ravulizumab. We've got a different drug, pegcetacoplin, which is now approved for PNH, and ongoing trials looking at factor B and factor D inhibitors. For cold agglutinin disease, 2021, so not that long ago, we got sutimlimab, which is a C1S inhibitor. Ongoing trials looking at pegcetacoplin. For thrombotic uh, microangiopathy, ecolizumab, we've got narcolipamab, um, it has a priority review. And then we've also got other C5 inhibitors. And then for other diseases, um, we've got sutimlimab and ITP. We've got in, um, studies that are going on in COVID-19, et cetera. So to borrow uh, Buzz Lightyear's uh, catchphrase, you know, compliment I think is really um, the sky's the limit to infinity and beyond, right? We've got our old pals, first generation. We know that there are problems with them, right? Their IV administration, high dose, frequent dosing, and they totally block whatever we're looking at. There's going to be second generation drugs that are going to be sub Q. Hopefully, they're going to be more complement modulating rather than total blockade. They may be targeting neopeptides and activation products. They're gonna have a longer duration of action and some of them are actually even oral. That third generation, people are looking at trying to deliver complement inhib inhibition across barriers like the red brain barrier. Thinking about how can we deliver this to a specific organ of interest? And then there may also be gene therapy to deal with some of those issues of um, control of activation or overactivation. And then there's lots of crosstalk, right? 
So how can we parlay our increase in complement knowledge to try to have effects on adaptive immunity, intracellular complement? Is complement going to be important in other systems? Can we use our knowledge in complement to affect coagulation disorders like thrombosis? Can we use it to affect other non-immunologically mediated disorders like vaso-occlusive crisis in sickle cell disease? There's so many potential opportunities where we may be able to harness our growing knowledge of complement. So I say stay tuned. I think that you know, interaction with the complement system is here to stay. I think it has provided a benefit to a subgroup of patients that we previously didn't have good therapeutics for, and it may provide additional benefit for patients who have some of our more common disorders. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that anyone might have.